It was supposed to be a relaxing family camping weekend in the secluded Montana mountains. But Jeff's peaceful retreat turned into sheer terror when he witnessed something emerge from the nearby creek in the dead of night. In his own words, Jeff tells us the harrowing play-by-play, -play, describing his desperate struggle to escape with his family as he finds himself face to face with something lurking in the darkness of the forest. Hold your breath as Jeff's white knuckle account pulls you into the eerie unknown of that dreaded night. Last summer, my wife, kids and I went camping in the mountains of Western Montana. We found this great little spot right off the trail, nestled between some tall pines and a babbling creek. It was pretty remote and peaceful, just what we liked. The first couple nights were totally normal. We cooked hot dogs and s'mores over the fire, went on short hikes, that kind of thing. But on the third night, something really strange happened that I'll never be able to explain. I woke up around 3 a.m. having to use the bathroom. I unzipped the tent as quietly as I could, trying not to wake up my wife and kids. When I stepped outside, there was this bizarre, faint bluish light filtering through the trees. It seemed to be coming from the direction of the creek bed. At first, I thought it could be somebody else's campfire or one of those new style lights, even though we hadn't seen any other campers in the area. But the light didn't flicker or move like a regular fire. It was this steady, almost pulsating glow. I figured I should check it out, just to be safe and make sure there wasn't a dangerous wildfire or something starting nearby. So I grabbed a flashlight and my hiking boots and carefully made my way through the trees toward the creek, trying to be as quiet as possible. When I got to the creek bed, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There in the middle of the creek was this thing, a living creature, but not normal. It was around six or seven feet tall, sort of hunched over and shambling slowly up the creek bed. Its body seemed mostly human shaped, but it was extremely thin and gangly with long arms that dragged close to the ground. Its skin looked slimy and translucent, almost like it was made of blue jelly and the light this eerie, bluish glow seemed to be emanating from its body. I was absolutely frozen, gripping my flashlight tight. The creature moved slowly but deliberately downstream, completely ignoring me. It made no noise, just this gentle sloshing as it waded through the creek, and then it rounded a bend and was gone. Part of me thought I must be dreaming or hallucinating, but this felt too real. I was completely drawn to the thing, and I knew I had to follow it and get a better look. So I pulled myself together and quickly but carefully made my way downstream in the direction the creature had gone. Rounding the bend, I could still see the faint bluish glow ahead. I crouched down and moved slowly, using the trees and boulders for cover. The glow seemed to be stopping and starting, like the creature was moving in fits and starts now. Then I saw it again through a break in the foliage. It had pulled itself halfway out of the creek and was crouched on the bank, its long, spindly arms and legs bent at unsettling angles. The glow from its body was brighter now, pulsating gently. That's when I noticed its face for the first time, or what I guessed was its face, two sunken holes where eyes would be and a small, lipless slit that looked like a mouth set in a partial, skull-like structure but the whole thing seemed malleable and shapeless, like it could contort into any expression. It cocked its head from side to side, as if sniffing the air or listening intently. Then it opened that tiny mouth and let out a garbled wheeze, like air being forced through a broken trumpet. It didn't seem human or animal, but almost linguistic, like it was trying to communicate in some unknown tongue. I instinctively shrunk back, not wanting to be noticed. That's when my foot knocked against a loose rock with a loud crack. The creature's head snapped towards me instantly, those empty eye sockets locking onto my position. We were frozen like that for several horrifying seconds, just staring at each other through the creekside foliage. Then, without warning, the creature let out another one of those wheezing sounds, like a harsh, animalistic call. 
Its gangly arms and legs started to contort in unsettling ways as it pulled itself fully upright. That's when I knew I had to get out of there. Without thinking, I turned and ran, crashing through the underbrush as quietly as I could manage. I could hear animated splashing and garbling noises behind me. It was giving chase. My heart felt like it was going to explode as I tore through the dark forest, branches whipping my face. I had no idea if this thing was predatory or what it might do if it caught me. All I could think about was getting back to the safety of my family's campsite. Finally, I burst through the tree line and saw the campsite in the distance. I risked a look over my shoulder. No sign of pursuit, at least for the moment. Panting heavily, I hurried to the tent and shook my wife's shoulder. Wake up, I whispered urgently. We have to get out of here now. She started to protest, but I cut her off, quickly explaining what I'd seen. The kids were awake too at this point, looking scared. As much as I had tried to stay quiet, they had heard me talking to my wife. We broke camp as fast as we could, shoving everything haphazardly into the car. As we sped away down the forest road, I kept watching the creek bed through the trees, half expecting that glowing, twisted form to come after us. But there was no sign of it. We made it home safe, but I'll never forget that chilling, inexplicable encounter. What was that thing? Where did it come from? The questions still haunt me to this day, and sometimes I can't sleep through the night. Wish me luck in getting past all of this. Thanks. Not everybody likes fishing. It's an acquired taste, don't you think? It takes a lot of patience and a lot of appreciation. Not everyone is ready to slow down enough to relax by the water and stare at a line. There are times, though, when fishing isn't boring. When the line flickers suddenly in the water, the pole jolts, the moment before the fish reaches the surface, revealing a small or magnificent catch. Fishing can be an exciting sport, too. It can also be terrifying, especially when the thing rising from the depths isn't your typical fish, or it isn't a fish at all. Nick spent the day at his usual spot just outside of Washington, D.C. He wasn't a big fisherman by any stretch of the imagination. He wasn't particularly skilled, and he didn't have any photos of him with a prized catch hanging on his wall. He just liked the quiet. He liked putting as much distance between himself and work as possible. The easiest place to achieve that was out there by the water. The current of the river swept away his stress, and all he had to focus on was the line. When it jumped in the water, it was exciting. It was a reward for all his waiting. It was fun, you know? Something truly fun and nothing more. It didn't have to be any more complicated than that. He rushed forward and grabbed the handle of his pole. He tugged on it, ensuring the hook was set in his catch, and began to turn the reel. It didn't take Nick long to remember he wasn't a master fisherman. The pole lurched forward and nearly yanked him into the water. It took all of his strength to keep from toppling face first into the depths. Whatever he'd hooked, it was big. He fought with all his might, praying that the line and the rod wouldn't snap in his hands. He walked backwards from the bank of the river, trying to lead the fish instead of just reeling it in. Was that the right thing to do? He didn't know. He was just having fun. Then the water started to ripple. It rippled more than it would for a fish. It rippled from the end of his line, where it disappeared beneath the surface, to a good three or more meters downstream. What was that? Was it just the fish splashing, writhing beneath the water and causing an effect further down? Nick didn't know if that was possible. He just wanted to catch the thing. When it started to surface, he had second thoughts. It was long. He realized that when the thing's head first peaked above the water, it had a big jaw. That's all he could tell at first. It appeared then vanished very quickly, fighting him and the line. As the head disappeared, the tail thrashed too. It kicked above the surface and revealed its position. Further away than Nick first thought. It was huge. 
its back appeared next. It appeared one curled hump at a time, slithering above the water and then sinking back down below. It was covered in scales. Spiked ridges lined its spine. It was unlike anything Nick had ever seen. He was on autopilot by then. He didn't want to catch the thing anymore, but his body was acting independently of his mind. If he started to grasp the real gravity of the situation, he'd freeze. He'd drop to the ground, pull his knees to his chest, and start shaking. It was easier to focus on the fishing. All at once, the creature revealed its full anatomy. The line snapped. He felt it jerk its head back so sharply that the rod didn't have a chance of staying attached. He fell backward and landed in the dirt. He could only look up from that point as the serpent-like monster rose from the water. Its neck was long and eel-like, flowing without paws into its body and tail. Small fins lined the torso. Nick couldn't imagine them doing much, not that he was too fixated on their function. He was instead glued to the creature's eyes. It held itself upright, like a pillar from the water, rising at least seven feet in the air. It held that position, immune to the water coursing around it, and glared down at Nick. It was as if the creature was scolding him, judging him, deciding what to do with the man who had accidentally hooked it. Nick did what any reasonable person would do. He apologized. The serpent didn't seem to understand. It wasn't suddenly possessed by a great intellect or comprehension. It didn't nod, but it did seem to grow bored. It slowly lowered itself back into the water, disappearing one inch at a time. Eventually, its wide jaw was covered by the water. Its eyes disappeared next. Then it was gone completely, leaving Nick to wonder what exactly had happened. He checked the water more closely to see if he could see the beast swimming away. The water was too murky. He backed away from the ledge just to be safe. He packed up his things and went home. He put his fishing rod in the shed next to his workbench and toolbox and committed it to a lifetime of gathering dust. He could find other ways to pass the time. He could find a peaceful distraction far away from that river. Not everybody likes fishing. Most people have a good reason why. Nick enjoyed it once upon a time. Then he realized that the creatures lurking below the surface might not want to be caught. Worst of all, he realized that some of them might be capable of catching the very people relaxing near the edge of the water. Suddenly, sitting on the bank of a river felt a lot like tempting fate. It felt a lot like waiting for the hook to slip into your mouth and the line to pull you under. From then on, Nick only went fishing periodically. And even then, most of those times were with friends. I'm just an ordinary guy, but I had one experience a few years back that I can't explain or forget. It happened in the summer of 2016 when I was 27 years old. I was visiting my cousin who lives in a pretty rural area of eastern Oregon, out near the Wallowa Mountains. One afternoon, my cousin mentioned the spot in the woods behind his property where we used to build forts and camp out when we were kids. For some reason, I really wanted to find that old fort spot and see if any remnants were still there after all these years. My cousin said he hadn't been back there in forever, but was game to head out and look for it. We headed out into the forest, following a faint trail from his backyard. As we walked, I was struck by how much I remembered these woods, from specific trees to random paths and where they led. After about a mile, we came to a little clearing where I recognized some landmarks. I thought for sure that this had to be the fort spot. Sure enough, there were some scattered sticks and rocks indicating kids had built tiny structures here long ago. My cousin and I poked around remembering our old games. That's when I noticed something odd, a set of tracks that didn't seem normal. They weren't hoof prints or paw prints, but sort of a crossed line pattern, almost like webbed feet. The tracks went off into some thick brush and tangled underbrush. Against my better judgment, I followed them out of sheer curiosity and stupid boldness. 
my cousin reluctantly came along to make sure I didn't get lost or hurt. The further we went, the bigger and weirder the tracks became. At one point, they almost looked like a handprint mixed with the weird toe marks. We ended up in a ravine area, totally disoriented from the main trail. That's when we heard a noise. It was like a low grunting mixed with a weird chittering sound I can't replicate. It seemed to be coming from multiple sources and reverberated all around us. I've honestly never heard anything like it in nature before. My cousin and I just stood there frozen, utterly confused and a little scared if I'm being honest. Then we saw something moving through the tangled branches and behind the trunks of some big pines. It was big, that much I could tell, at least eight feet tall, but it seemed to be able to squeeze through incredibly tight spaces. The grunting and chittering got louder as more of them emerged from the underbrush. We watched in stunned silence as these huge, vaguely humanoid, but also bizarrely insect-like creatures gathered in the ravine just yards from where we stood concealed. There were at least five or six of them communicating with each other in those haunting grunts and chitters. My cousin and I just tried to breathe as shallowly as possible and not make a sound. These things were utterly alien. They seemed to have a roughly human-like body shape. Two legs, two arms, upright posture. But their skin looked hard and insect-like with all these ridges and flanges. Their faces were the stuff of nightmares, too. No visible eyes, nose, or mouth that I could discern. Just weird whisker-like protrusions coming out of a small hollow area. As they gathered in the ravine, they started making even weirder combined grunting and buzzing sounds, almost like they were communicating through vibrations or something. I noticed they had these big appendages sticking out of their backs that began to undulate and oscillate. The noises and movements seemed to be linked in some pattern between the creatures. One of the larger ones dropped down on all fours and made a frenetic rocking, shuddering motion while the appendages whirred wildly. The others followed suit, pummeling the ground with these freakish convulsions in unison. I felt sick watching them. My cousin grabbed my arm to keep me from fainting or something. After several minutes of this bizarre ceremony or mating ritual or whatever the hell it was, the creatures seemed to, I don't know, reach some sort of crescendo in their frenzy. Then, as suddenly as it began, they froze. The whirring stopped. The grunts and chitters ceased. Utter silence blanketed the ravine. For what felt like an eternity, they just stayed frozen in these contorted positions. My heart was pounding out of my chest. Then, the largest one reared up on its hind legs and made a deafening shriek that sounded like a hundred people being tortured at once. The others joined in with slightly varying shrieks of their own in an unholy chorus of agony. That's when my cousin lost it. He started pulling me away, retreating as quietly as we could back towards the main trail. I was too scared and dazed to protest. We must have hightailed it for over a mile before we finally stopped to catch our breath. I'll never forget the look on my cousin's face. Sheer terror. Neither of us has ever went back to those woods or spoken a word about what we saw. But I'll never unsee those nightmarish creatures and their horrifying behavior. I have no idea what they were, where they came from, or what they were doing. All I know is I never want to cross paths with them again. My parents died when I was very young. They had gotten into a car accident and affected me really hard. But now I'm 25 and living just outside of LA. Yes, even with all the crazy stuff going on, somehow I am still here. I had been an aspiring actress and model, but since everything's gone down, I kind of decided to possibly change my career. My grandmother looked after me on her farm in Baltimore as a kid, and it was very fulfilling. My grandmother was a woman of the land. She devoured books and read like nobody else I knew and could tell a story that would rivet any audience. 
As her only grandchild, I grew up being told of strange creatures, near and far. Some that flew in the sky, some that stalked through the woods, and some that even lived under my bed. These creatures seemed real to me, not at all scary, but more mysterious. I can still hear my grandmother's rattly voice telling me of the man that looked like a dog that she spotted late at night through her bin. That was one of her stories that made me laugh. I figured it was just a local drunk that hadn't shaven in a few days, or a homeless guy. Since she read so many stories about monsters to me, you know, like the ones in the closet or the ones that will come out of the woods and grab you if you don't eat your vegetables, I had no real discernment of knowing that this was something true that she saw. I had also read in the Guinness Book of World Records that some people had so much facial hair that it grew minutes after shaving it. So I figured this creature that my grandmother spoke of was a guy like this, but something about this was different. I remember her whispering to me, no, no, her gravelly voice shaking with trepidation, explaining to me that this was a sighting far more terrible than any other and that this was real. My grandmother's father and mother came over from London, England, and so she had a hint of an English accent. She didn't present herself like most country women. Her gray hair was tied up in an elegant bun, and she wore makeup even, despite her face being lined with wrinkles from hard work in the sun. Then one night, when I was around 10 years old, after, long after the car accident, my grandmother had tucked me in bed and I looked out at our small farm, stretches of land. By the way, at this point in the story, I was already living with my grandmother full time since my parents had already passed away and I was in the process of grieving and dealing with all of this. Anyway, it seemed a lonely place for any creature, I thought as I lied there listening to her stories. Sleep was coming for me and I felt that floaty feeling in your head as it's filled with nothingness, images turning rhythmically, and then you enter dreamland. I awoke with a sudden jerk and I remember hearing something guttural, something groaning just outside my window. But the problem was my bedroom was on the second floor and overlooked our prized chestnut tree, which was now orange and amber, with Baltimore October bringing a beautiful autumn. Now I jumped out of my bed and looked out to see what it was. Perhaps one of my cattle had escaped, but that had never happened before, not that I knew of, and never could imagine making a sound like this. This was almost a growl, like a gnawing sound. Very animalistic, and I never heard it before. Pressing my ear to the window, I could hear the same rasping sound. I turned my head to the side and looked directly at our tree, and I witnessed one of the most horrendous, disturbing visions any child could ever see. My favorite pony at the time, which by the way, my grandmother had several, her name was Jasmine. She was dead, laid horizontally, her white coat ripped open and covered with blood and her innards spewn all throughout the lawn. It was awful. I was in shock and started crying. Above her, though, was something far more terrifying. I didn't make it out right away, but as I looked closer, I could see a large, dark shape that was leaning over her body. Whatever had killed her was right there. Then the shape looked up at me and stood up on two legs all at the same time. Large, yellow, glowing eyes, fur as black as the night, and very, very large and muscular. It was like a ripped six-pack all throughout its muscles. It was so buff, and it had large black claws, each at least six inches long, if I'm not mistaken. This was what I could only describe to you as a werewolf or a wolfman. Its face, however, was not that of a dog, though. And when I say wolf, I mean it looked like a really fierce, evil wolf with giant fangs that hung outside of its mouth. It even had blood dripping down from its chin. Whatever this thing was had not only killed Jasmine, but was eating on her still. Although I wanted to turn my face away, I kept on staring, transfixed in total fear and terror. My heart was sinking into my stomach and sickness was rising to my throat. I was hoping this was a nightmare, that this horror before my bedroom window was fiction. I felt like vomiting, I was looking right into hell, my very own gallery of horror and me on the front row. After this thing turned to face me, it crouched back down and turned its attention back towards its meal. I shuddered and nearly fainted, falling backwards. 
My grandmother was behind me, her mouth in open horror and concern. She convinced me that this was the devil. We went to bed, crying in each other's arms and praying for morning to come. My grandfather had passed away long ago, so it's not like my grandmother could have charged out there barreling with a gun in its face. Nor was she that type of woman to do that. We both hid in her bedroom with the door locked and cried all night. In the morning, the only real thing left of Dasmond wasn't very pretty. We gave her a dignified burial. Her carcass was now mostly consumed. This story has had me inside for a long time, and the experience happened many years ago. In fact, most therapists think the beast serves as a metaphor for my fears. Some unresolved trauma welled deep within my soul. It really caused me a lot of issues during my high school years. Like I just told you, I stay inside most of the time. In fact, I missed a lot of social outings and opportunities to go hang out with friends a lot. But I know well different that this thing, this creature, was real. The memory is so very vivid in my mind. I have been on efforts to lock it away in the deepest points of my memory, but it still emerges to haunt me in my dreams and during my day. My grandmother died a while after the incident and I continued to stay at a boarding school. I have never been back on the farm since I was a kid and sometimes I still have the urge to go and see the plot where we buried Jasmine. I just hope that this experience can serve as a reminder to you or to anybody else you choose to read this to, to never be too careful about being in the wild. Although there are some things that are just pure evil, and I believe this was one of them. Let me share with you a story that's going to make your skin crawl. So, there I am, in the middle of the night, smack dab in the Florida Everglades. Now you're probably wondering what in the world was I doing in the Everglades at the dead of the night. Well, I was on a fishing trip. I mean, there's something about the night, it's all calm and quiet, and those suckers just bite at that time. And so there I was, getting my boat ready. I remember having my bait bucket filled with live shrimp and some cut mullet for the bottom feeders. With a cooler of beer by my side, I was all set. The night was all lit up with the moon, and there was a gentle breeze, too. My usual routine was simple. I'd bait the hook, cast it into the water, pop open a beer, and then sit back and wait for a bite. That night, though, well, it was different. The fish were biting okay, so there was no problem on that end. But there was this smell that first spooked me, like something old and organic, like deep earth, meat gone bad, and sulfur all together. I remember looking down at my bait, wondering if I had left it in the sun for too long or something. But nah, that wasn't it. The odor was more pungent than a bait bucket left in the sun. It was stronger, permeating the air around me, making my stomach roll. Part of me wanted to pack it up and head back right then. But I thought, no, that would be crazy. I just figured the wind had changed and started blowing from the mangroves or something. To distract myself, I tried focusing on the fishing. I cast off again, deeper into the water this time. But even as I was waiting for a tug on my line, a growing unease started to crawl up my back. Maybe it was the awful smell, or maybe it was the sudden silence amidst the nocturnal sounds of the swamp. But something was definitely off. Ever hear the phrase, something in the air, like you don't see anything, don't hear anything, but you can feel in your gut that something isn't right? That's precisely what I felt. I've been out in these waters countless times before, but never once did I feel like I wasn't alone until that night. Anyway, I thought it was just me being paranoid, chalked it up to too many ghost stories around the campfire. But then I saw these two lights, small and bright as stars, just floating a few feet away from where I'd cast my line. They were too low to be stars and too stationary to be fireflies. My gut curdled as I squinted into the darkness, trying to make out what could be producing those dots in the pitch black swamp. The lights were oval and they didn't blink or flutter like an animal's eyes would. They just hung there, steady and unwavering in the darkness. My mind started racing with what they could be. Swamp gas, 
moonlight reflecting off the water, or maybe even some camper's lantern caught in the trees. My mind tried to come up with anything that remotely made sense. The light, those two creepy dots, started to inch higher into the air, well above where the average man's head would be. And then those lights, they just snapped out all of a sudden, swallowed by the darkness. Now you'd think that's a good thing, right? But damn, it wasn't. Instantly, there was nothing tranquil about the place anymore. The usual chit-chat of the swamp went quiet. The wind seemed to hold its breath, and even the moon wasn't shining as bright. In the blink of an eye, there was a loud sort of whoosh, like the sound a good wave makes when it crashes on the beach, followed by splashes in the water like something coming down from above. The next thing I knew, the whole swamp lit up the water shimmering with this sort of weird, bluish light. It was brighter than the sun, and just too sudden against the absolute darkness. I tell you, at that moment, in that glaring light, I saw something standing in the part of the marsh where the light was descending. It was like a scene out of some crazy sci-fi movie. There in front of me, barely a few feet away, was a humanoid being. It stood roughly five feet tall, all skinny and weirdly proportioned, with a large head that seemed too big for its frail body. But what shocked me the most were its eyes, large as saucers, and so black they looked like windows to nothingness. I couldn't make out a mouth or nose. It was as if its face was a blank slate except those bloody eyes. I've got to admit, I was scared as hell. I'm not ashamed to say that I froze, too petrified to even make a sound. This gray-skinned nightmare looking back at me didn't make any aggressive moves, but boy, the chill in its gaze, it was like it held no good intentions. One moment that thing was staring right at me, and the next, it simply vanished. The abrupt cutoff of the light blinded me for a sec. For a moment there, it was like the sun had gone black. My eyes stinging, I rubbed them, tried to clear the spots. When I finally got my sight back, it was all over. The thing was gone. The smell had disappeared too. The swamp was dark again, and the air was cold and bitter. I stayed still in my boat for a while longer, dumbstruck by the whole encounter. My mind was spinning, trying to catch up with what just happened. It felt like an eternity before I could move. My hand still had a death grip on the rod, my knuckles white from the strain. When I finally gathered myself, I drove the boat back, casting glances over my shoulder every now and then, half expecting that image to reappear. I don't think I even blinked, at least not until the sun was up and I was home. The following days were fuzzy. One part of me was still stuck in that swamp, wrestling with the horror that had descended from the lights. The other part was listening to the radio flipping through newspaper pages, hoping to see a mention of strange lights, or even better, someone else who'd seen what I had. But as you can guess, it didn't happen. With time, the fear faded, and a rational part of my mind took over, making its own adjustments to make sense of it all. Hell, for a while there, I even convinced myself that it might have been a bout of hallucinations, or too much beer, or too little sleep. So there you have it. My own encounter with what I can only describe as aliens. Crazy to think that I'm just your run-of-the-mill Floridian, trying to enjoy a peaceful night of fishing, and I live to tell a tale you'd see on late-night TV. Keep this between us, though, would you? Don't need folks around here thinking I'm a nut job or something. Anyway, that's all for now. Let that sink in, and let's see if anyone else has seen some.